you know, in the middle of this, you miss a lot of things, okay? Uh, there a lot of things getting swept under the rug. Uh, Lindsey Graham has announced um, these Senate hearings where uh, a bunch of Obama officials are going to be uh, called on the carpet, and we're finally going to start hearing from them. I suspect, here's my prediction, you will see a number of Obama Justice Department officials who will take the fifth. Um, and that's their right and everything else, but I don't think there's any way they can square up some of these answers, okay? And swept under the rug in the middle of what I believe, me personally, China, letting this Wuhan virus out and not telling us all the story and collaborating with the WHO to keep it under wraps and everything else. Now, we have international countries who are questioning Donald Trump's, our handling of different things, these are some of the worst countries on earth. And to break it down with me, Frankie joins me again along with Michael Johns. Uh, Michael Johns was uh, one of the co-founders of the Tea Party movement, political analyst, former speechwriter for President George H.W. Bush. And uh, Mike, oh, the hypocrisy now with China, Iran, Russia, and Venezuela criticizing us. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for... You know, for our entire adult lives, there's nothing new here. There has been, you know, I've been around the world and I've witnessed a lot of this. Um, and in my interactions with foreign media, I've witnessed it. There is an, has been for a long time an ongoing campaign to delegitimize the United States as most Americans know it, which is a beacon of freedom, an exceptional nation, unlike any other unparalleled freedoms, unparalleled prosperity. And so these governments and their government controlled media outlets, because they're not free media outlets uh, in countries like China, increasingly in Iran, uh, in Venez even in Venezuela, are really on the outlook for any one of these uh, opportunities to depict the United States in a um, delegitimizing way. And in, um, in each one of these cases, they have absolutely seized on to this George Floyd incident, misrepresenting it um, and, the, and the aftermath of the protests is vastly more violent than they actually were. And, and, and suggesting really in their coverage that this sort of incident with George Floyd, which I think all of us know is both appalling and hugely unusual, is something that happens systematically and routinely within the United States. Well, yeah, I think you're. I think you're exactly right. I'm curious, Michael, what you think the political ramifications will be. In 1968, you saw both Nixon and George Wallace use the riots in the street to kind of strengthen their case for law and order. And between the two of them, they uh, did very well. Won a whole bunch of states. Nixon, of course, won the election. Trump seems to be trying to do that this time around, but it does seem like the um, leftist base is also a bit energized. If you were giving advice to the president and his team right now, what would you be telling about how to benefit politically? I hate to couch it in those terms, but there is an election in five months. Right. How would, how, what would you suggest? Well, these protests are, have a huge political dimension to it, so it's an entirely reasonable question and a reasonable discussion for us to have. I, you know, it's my belief that particularly those who've been involved in the most extreme violence aren't particularly concerned about the plight of George Floyd. They see it as an opportunity to present the nation in chaos and to advance their agenda. The, the advice, so I think, would be, number one, the president has done some fairly impressive things thus far since this um, incident nearly three weeks ago. Number one, he immediately referred it to the Department of Justice. It's not a common uh, step by a president or any member of the executive branch to engage in a what is essentially a local law enforcement matter where charges are, as you know, uh, um, been leveled against this officer. So I think I don't think that's widely known by the American people. I, I, I think he's in a position right now where he needs to walk through and say, again, which, which he's already said, number one, I was appalled by what I saw in that video. He's made he has said that and did say that immediately reiterating that number two, I took this seriously as a federal law enforcement matter and referred it on to our Department of Justice for, for investigation. Um, and number three, I am, which I think all of this is consistent with polling, 
and these are very contrasting sentiments from about what I'm about to say. I am empathetic, sympathetic with the emotions of the American people who looked upon this and said, this is not something we want really to ever again happen in the United States. Um, I think it's important to emphasize the statistics because there's emotion and there's fact. I think um, the, those with the most raging emotions have been led to believe that there's somewhat a routine law enforcement um, assault on African Americans in this country. And in reality, I think he should cite these statistics. Last year, there were 375 million interactions between police and civilians in this country. That's an extraordinary number. Uh, it's, lot, it's more than one per person. And of those, 19 unarmed whites were killed by law enforcement and nine unarmed blacks were killed by law enforcement with each one of those 19 and nine cases there's they're not completely clear-cut in all cases but this point statistically to the fact that completely rebuts the position being presented by antifa and even black lives matter that there is any systemic nature to lethal violence against african americans in this country that does not exist factually does not exist. That's not a matter of opinion. It factually does not exist. Now, if you want to get into the issues of are there issues for police reform in the way of maybe excessive policing of suspected African-American criminal activity, things of that nature, disrespect of Fourth Amendment rights, there could be issues there. There likely are issues there. There's certainly a boatload of anecdotal evidence that there's issues there, but that's very different than what these protests are about. So I think he's got to go through and say, here's what I've, here's what happened. Here's what I did. Here's what I am doing. I, I do have empathy and sympathy for those who are appalled by this. But I want to reassure the American people that unlike non-democratic um, countries of the world where they don't hold law, law enforcement or their security personnel accountable, we do in this country. And then to go through it, you know, this guy's in, in jail. He's got a high bail and he's facing very serious charges. Absolutely. Hey, um, Mike, uh, there are, it just seems to me like the blue cities and the blue states are the places where all this crap is going on. Um, you know, like a year and a half ago or so, President Trump said, if you're a sanctuary city, I'm going to take away your law enforcement grants. So Trump was actually ahead of the game, right? He was trying to defund the police in sanctuary cities with their federal grants before they were saying they were fighting them saying you can't take away our police money now they're saying defund so maybe trump was on to something back then it's all the same mayors yeah i mean there's boatloads of hypocrisy throughout this entire um last two weeks that's maybe one of the most glaring examples that you just cited john uh the other example obviously is that you know we were yeah in fact just the three of us just weeks ago talking about individuals you know a salon owner in dallas who was being arrested because she was trying to you know make a living and provide for her family by opening her salon and selectively you know taking in clients mm. and here we had hundreds of thousands of individuals in some of these very same locales with these restrictive social distancing policies and to my knowledge maybe i'm wrong about this but i've asked around and looked around i'm not aware of one citation that was is issued against any individual who participated in this. So it's a, one of the dangers, and this is a dangerous trend in the United States of America, and I believe it started exactly with what you referenced in sanctuary cities and illegal immigration, is we have the laws on the books as they exist and the laws on the books as they're actually enforced. And we set a precedent um, a long time ago with illegal immigration that that was a crime in this country, but it was not going to be enforced. And then we had the issues of other things that branched off from that, including the fact that you could be detained by police if you're an illegal alien and not turned over to ICE for deportation. And, and this has sort of taken on, and we've seen it in these riots with a complete lack of policing, um, made a conscious decision by local law enforcement not to stop vast amounts of what I'm sure are tens of millions of dollars of, of damage in these cities. No it's doubt about that. Oh, there. yeah. Right. No arrests, no citations, really, for the most part. 
And even on the Antifa being declared a terrorist organization, this is where I think the president's got is at a crossroads in this presidency right now is he's got to separate his, his rhetoric on these issues, which is, is pretty good with the actual follow up. Yeah. You know, you open, you open with these Russian, the, 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 um, uh, the testimony coming up with Obama officials. You yeah. Know, Congress can't prosecute anybody. The Department of Justice has to do that. Right. And I know I think a lot of supporters want to see that, you know, pursued and an explanation as to why they're not being prosecuted if that's not happening. Okay. We got to leave it there, Mike. Thanks a lot. We'll see you again next Friday. We'll see you guys right over the top of the hour. We're coming back right after this with more liquid lunch.